Hank Williams once said of today's subject that if you wanted to draw a crowd in the South, first you called on God, then you called on today's subject. Today's subject once said of Hank Williams, son, you got a million dollar talent in a 10 cent brain. This is The Righteous by Jambo, and it's time to talk about Roy Akers. Two hundred and fifty odd years ago, the United States sent the British royal family packing. Although they have learned today that if you really want to destroy the British monarchy, joining them works better than beating them. But when it comes to music, Americans do seem to have a charming devotion to adding to the corpus of royalty with an entire hierarchy of musical nobility and general honorifics. There's a king of rock and roll, a king of the blues, a king of the swing, and an empress of the blues. Three kings of New Orleans trumpet, a king and queen of pop, two rival kings of soul, an undisputed queen of soul, a king of the surf guitar, a queen of R&B, a queen of folk, queen bee, queen, a king of ska, five co-regent emperors of soul, Count Basie, two... two dukes, one of jazz and one thin white one, a raft of pop princesses but only one prince, a prince of darkness, a much more democratic president of the saxophone, a first lady of song, a first family of country, godfathers of ska, soul, heavy metal and punk, a chairman of the board and a boss and even the more workaday genius, professor and doctor. We even now have a Miss Americana. Not that we didn't already have one. But of all the titles handed out by popular acclaim or publicity departments, there is one that will never be disputed, none more ever rightfully given and none more humbly worn than the title of the King of Country Music, and the one, the only, and the ever King of Country Music is the great Roy Acuff. So beloved was Roy Acuff that during World War II, Japanese propagandists found that fake news about his death had a far more deleterious effect on American morale than fake news about President Roosevelt's death. So beloved was Roy Acuff that when he did a tour of California in the immediate post-war years, when California was still considered risky territory for country music, so many relocated and deracinated Texans, Okies and Georgia boys, etc., who had moved west for war work, were turning out for his gigs that local fire departments got to making a habit of closing venues down even before the night of the show. So beloved was Roy Acuff that when he decided to make some extra money selling songbooks for a quarter and plug the venture to patrons at the Grand Old Opry on Saturday night, by the following Wednesday there were 10,000 quarters piled up in the offices of WSM. There weren't but a handful of songbooks to go around, but folks just trusted Roy to get their books to them. The songbook eventually sold 100,000 copies and gave Acuff the germ of the idea for Acuff Rose Music Publishing. So beloved was Roy Acuff that when Republicans nominated him as a joke writing candidate for governor of Tennessee in 1948, after both the Democrats and Republicans sought him to run in 1944, he was selected regardless and increased the Republican vote by 7% in a heavily Democrat state. He later said the best things the Democrats ever did for Tennessee was to stop him from becoming governor. Roy Acuff had hit records in seven different decades. He was the first living person elected to the Country Music Hall of Fame. He was the first country music performer to be honoured with the National Medal for the Arts. He taught Richard Nixon how to do yo-yo tricks. Roy Acuff is such a singular figure that it seems almost trite to say that Elvis Presley is to rock and roll as Acuff is to country. They both took the existing order, amplified it, went nationwide with it, and as their relevance ebbed, Presley's much faster than Acuff's, they came to embody the music they came to symbolise, but with Acuff as a conservative, Presley as a reactionary. 
Prior to the years just before World War II, country artists had always been semi-professional at best, bound to their rural work and land in the Depression-era economy. Those talented or lucky enough to gain a contract with or on one of the local ensemble radio stations, of which the Grand Old Opry was the best established and most prestigious, had to be available as required to perform on broadcast nights, usually Saturday night. Now, Saturday was the best night for booking gigs in the Honky Tonk, so it made it very hard for performers to arrange any kind of regular income from gigs or tours because they always had to be within driving distance of the farm or, as their contract stipulated, the Opry, Hayride or whoever. And the middle to lower tier performers didn't even know when their radio show would require them, often only getting noticed that day. Although he is forever associated as the personification of the Grand Old Opry, Akev actually quit the venerable institution in 1946, frustrated that they were impinging on his right to earn a living. With that, Roy Akev was one of the very first performers to make himself a full professional, quitting the Opry, basing himself in Nashville and touring the country extensively. He got involved in music publishing and promotion, assisting the Opry to book its own tours and becoming one of the very first, if not the very first, country artists to promote themselves as a brand as much as an in-person presence. When Hank Williams was fired from the Opry, an act Acuff advised Opry manager Jim Denny on doing and for which Acuff later expressed great regret, such was his celebrity and the value of his brand, he could leverage a much better contract out of the rival Louisiana Hayride, which allowed Williams to pursue lucrative income streams from touring had he been sober enough to follow through. It was pursuing a missed gig from one such tour that Williams expired barely three months after signing with the Hayride, in a story that will one day be told here on The Righteous Bojambo. But this showed the up-and-coming generation of honky-tonk singers, who were to rule country for the next decade, that they could leverage touring to build their following more than the radio, and big radio became a destination for successful acts rather than the only way they could be launched. So, it was an early ride to hillbilly heaven for Hank, but a long and prosperous and interesting to say the least life for Roy Aker. But to be honest, by the time Hank had moved from the caddy to his silver casket, Roy Aker had already lived the life of four men and had opened the door to country music as a national phenomenon, which the young Turks like Williams were to charge through and create the biggest music in America for the next 50 years. Born in 1903 in Maynardsville, Tennessee, 25 miles or so northeast of Knoxville, to a relatively well-to-do family with a doctor, a senator and the local Baptist preacher amongst his immediate kinfolk. In common with a number of country music performer peers, Akif was a bit of a jack of all trades, an accomplished fiddler, singer, comic, athlete and boxer. He was also quite the tearaway as a young man, getting himself arrested quite a few times for brawling. After trying his hand at several trades, he tried out as a semi-pro baseball player, making the grade at a Giants farm team until a severe sunstroke ended his career. He turned his energies back to the fiddle, practicing the records on his front porch until long end of the night. In 1932, he joined a medicine show where his fiddling and banjo playing made him a popular attraction. But it was his unique vocal technique that really caught the attention. Because Akef not only sang well, superbly well in fact, but he sang loud, which helped him slice through the din and the ruckus of travelling shows and revivalist meets. Like Charlie Poole before him, Akef was an adopter and adapter of older musical forms. Akef channeled the songs and particularly the melodies of the hill music he grew up listening to and tweaked them to an audience a generation further removed from that which Charlie Poole held in thrall in the mid-twenties. After making his name with a big hit in The Great Speckled Bird in 1936, Akef got to the Grand Old Opry in 38. Country music singing pretty much began and ended with him. Blessed with, by any objective standard, a magnificent voice, it was how Akef chose to sing with it that was the all-time game changer. Hitched to a broad Tennessee accent, he sang out loud, which made him super clear on the staticky radio. 
His voice was a keying roar, racked with emotion, and that quality the Southerners valued most in their singers called sincerity, and instantly identifiable to anyone from the South as one of theirs. Akif was one of the key elements in initiating and finalising country music's shift from a primarily instrumental form to a primarily vocal one. Like Bing Crosby or Bessie Smith with the electric microphone, Akif was a performer who found his medium above all others. Everything about Roy Akif was meant for the 50,000 watts of mega power that WSM blasted out on Saturday evenings. And no song better spoke to his audience than perhaps Akif's best loved and certainly best selling record, The Warbash Cannonball. This is my favourite American folk song, and I do consider it that, ever, barring nothing. It's, to me, perfect in every way. The tune is an archetype. The lyrics have a sense of vastness and a hint of mystery. The subject is the weird old America that should never be let go of. And anyone who has any sense of the great myth of America should be able to relate in some way to it. It celebrates a freedom that can exist in vastness, the oneness of an all connected by common threads and the right of the individual to be aimless on their own terms and at whatever consequence. A much more romantic view of destiny. In his excellent book, Smile When You Call Me a Hillbilly, Country Music Struggle for Respectability, Jeffrey Lane contends that country music affiliated so readily with railroads as they were a reflection of a Southerner's clinging to their pride of place and the certainty of return there. Much the same way as songs reflected their religion and their sense of kin and their pride of region. Lang also contends that country train songs tend to travel east-west-east and blues songs south-north-south. Subsequently, country music began with trains. From the wreck of the old 97 to the Carters to Jimmy Rogers to Hank Snow to Hank Williams' I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry train to Johnny Cash and Merle Haggard, there were railroads to heaven and railroads to hell. The first performer on the Grand Old Opry was D. Ford Bailey who performed Pan American Blues, a train song. The Southern didn't cross the yellow dog, but the L and N was king. And Akif, especially in his 1947 recording, catches a moment when history, particularly the migratory history of America, was on the turn. Within five years, the railroads, symbol of the north-south ribbon that bound the south, were to begin their descent into irrelevance in the face of the national highway system. And the bridge that Akif built between the country music of yore and the modern, more urbanised experience, which was to become the core of honky-tonk music, was being crossed by innovators like Ernest Tubb and Hank Williams. Country was still outlier music, but with the waves of rural diaspora from the Depression and the blossoming post-war industrial era, it was becoming a nationwide community and the new wave of professional touring country musicians spearheaded by Akif and the great Bob Wills bound it together. Akif's sales dropped off in the 50s and 60s as he concentrated on touring and Honky Tonk and the Billy Sherrill country politan sound came to dominate the airwaves and he rejoined the Opry as an ambassador and an increasingly occasional performer, especially after a bad car wreck in 1965 and moved into a semi-retirement, a revered elder statesman of his music and the living embodiment of the Opry. In 1974, as the Opry moved from the Ryman to Opryland, Akif was chosen to MC the night and he performed the first number in the new venue. Naturally, it was the Wabash Cannonball. Akif probably didn't realise what he was doing, or necessarily the importance of what he was doing in the context of the industry and social changes going on around him. But it was his gifts and his self-respect and integrity that shaped the music such that it could survive them and prosper through them. Most likely he wouldn't recognise the travesty that country music has become since his death in 1992. But anyone who knows what country music can and should be knows it simply has to go back to Roy Akif and it'll all start again. Country music could not have chosen a more fitting or gracious king. Good morning, my friend. Wie geht es Ihnen? I hope you found this week's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. 
who are your favourite country singers of all time? Who do you consider to be the rightful king of country music if it's not indeed Roy Akeff? I would cherish your thoughts on that. In the meantime, grab a plate of biscuits and a cool beverage and settle down with the playlist that's listed underneath this presentation. So until the next time we gather together in good company or until the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down, you keep listening to the good stuff and you stay righteous. Well, hello there. I thought rather than close the video this week with the usual collection of japes and jokes and buffooneries and opportunities for deplatforming that comprise my usual blooper reel, I'd take you through the vinyl haul that I obtained at the King George Square record market last weekend. So the, the stacks at the record fair were exceptional, um, especially the, the, the jazz um, section. Everything I got was in really good condition vinyl. There were one or two um, iffy covers that, that need a little bit of repair. But um, it was a good, diverse selection. Um, I could have spent a bit longer dwelling on the on the rock stacks, but I'd pretty much blow, blown my budget by the time I got out of the blues section. This B.B. King album is a reissue, but the original Crown Records would have fallen to pieces long, long, long ago. So... A reissue on a decent piece of vinyl is a acceptable substitute. I was very excited to find the Miles album because it's nice to be able to have those prestige or the best of those prestige cuts on vinyl. This is a charming record. Um, early 70s, bring along a song, whoever turns up at the session will play it. A bit ramshackle. Um, Nicky Hopkins played with everyone, Jeff Beck, The Kinks, Donovan, The Who, The Stones, and died early of Crohn's disease, I believe. Ricky Lee Jones is here because I simply want to reassemble my 15-year-old record collection. Uh, Argus, this is one of the covers that needed a bit of work, so I'm away working on that, but uh, rock on, dude. This one was in absolutely impeccable condition. Um, also has the lyrics written in Japanese, so I suspect it's Japanese pressing or a practical joke. Um, how, did, how did I live without a copy of Reactor? I mean, it, it's just one of the great ruckus records of all time. We're going to finish up with three here from, from Brother Ray, uh, Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music, which was a vindication of one of the greatest gambles in the history of the record industry when ABC Paramount played Ray Charles 100,000 down, a $50,000 a year retainer, rights to his own publishing and eventually his own masters. They got it all back on that one record. They probably got it all back on the single I Can't Stop Loving You. Genius hits the road and it looks like they've all come out. There's Hendrix and Lemmy and Prince and Roboman and yeah, I got a big muff. What about